June, the Senate Gov Ops Committee on Wednesday, the 18th of January, and we are back. We are a little bit delayed, but we are going to get started again. And we have um, some witnesses who are joining us by Zoom. And we <clears throat> they're on Zoom. Our few ten witnesses. She um, she's at three thirty. There was oh okay, okay. so she was okay. This one's taking stuff. Hey Mike, are you there? There you are. <laughs> Hi Mike. Um, I am Ruth Hardy. I'm the chair of the Senate Gov Ops Committee. It's nice to see you. Um, we are going to just um, go around and introduce ourselves um, so you know who you're speaking with, and, and you can introduce yourself and your two um, colleagues who are with you, and then we, you can take it away with your testimony. Um, I'm, I apologize that we're a little bit late. Uh, we had a little break, and it was hard to get people to, to come back in the room, so um, that's why we're just a little not, behind. Not a problem. All right, thank you. Um, so uh, again, I'm Ruth Hardy, and we'll just go around the room. Uh, Olivia Parker, committee assistant. Tanya Kowski. Uh, Rebecca White. Bob Norris, Franklin One. And Watson, Washington District. Allison Clarkson, Windsor District. Good to see you, Mike. <laughs> Good to see you. <laughs> All right, uh, go ahead, Mike, and tell us uh, who you are, where, who you're with, and what you want us to know. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the Senate uh, Government Operations Committee. My name is Mike Donahue. I'm the uh, part-time executive director of the Vermont Press Association, which represents the interest of the uh, 10 daily and roughly three dozen or more uh, non-daily papers that circulate and cover the state of Vermont. Many of you know I wrote for the Free Press for like 46 years and I still do some freelance work for newspapers across Vermont. And I've been involved with a VPA for about four decades. With me today is our current uh, president, uh, Lisa Loomis, who is the co-owner, editor of the Valley Reporter, <clears throat> and our past president, John Flowers, who is uh, from the Addison Independent, senior reporter down there. The VPA newspapers serve uh, as the eyes and ears of nearly 650,000 Vermonters that want to know what is going on in their town, offices, in the state courts, under the Golden Dome, and out in their communities, especially when they can't get out to attend meetings, games, events due to work, family events, other conflicts. So we do, in fact, cover thousands and thousands of meetings a year. Uh, with a large turnover this year, thank you, Senator Hardy, for the invite to do the traditional biennium introduction for the committee, more so this year, to talk about our priorities for the new session um, and how we can help this committee I will say for more than three decades, it's been an honor to be invited uh, to be offering testimony to help earlier versions of your committee to craft bills that help Vermonters get improved access to government. Senator Clarkson has probably told you about all the hard work expected of this committee. And uh, I do salute uh, the work that has been done in the past. There's been some incredible work on open government, uh, public records, open meetings and so forth. I also know probably Senator Norris wants to get me on the witness stand after 30 years of, so he can grill me too. So uh, I look forward to <laughs> Today, trying to him, him trying to get even. <clears throat> well, while today's session was initially introduction of possible priorities last night in exchange with the chair, we agreed the VPA would try to focus mostly on uh, H42 today because since it has somewhat of a time sensitive priority, we certainly want to help move that along. If we can return another day to discuss some of the other priorities. Um, I would, however, just make one general comment about 
uh, the priorities of the BPA before moving on to, to H442. Vermont for many years had failing or near failing grades in national studies when it came to transparency, public meetings, public records, other open government issues. Uh, we are proud to have helped this Senate committee and your colleagues over on the House side with drafting bills that have moved Vermont toward the top of the transparency list, not national studies, but others are chipping away to try to get to the top. So we have to be vigilant. So we look forward to continuing to provide assistance. Concerning H42, I think the biggest concern that we've seen, uh, members have seen, are the lines 18 through 21, I think on page three, dealing with elimination of having a home base for all government meetings uh, so that the general public can at least attend, uh, have a site to go and have at least one public official or staffer present to be able to uh, participate in the meeting. Um, the open meeting law forever, or for almost ever, uh, well, for a long time, always required at least one public site to be available for the general public to go in and attend the meeting. And we ask that that provision be restored. We also ask that at least one member of the staff or the board be required to be at the designated spot. This obviously, you know, they need to help set up with uh, setting up for Zoom and, and setting up the room for the public. Uh, cable access channels and others also certainly need the hookups and to, to be able to get into the building and, and record everybody. So we think the, the bill is drafted is a move forward or a little less transparency, unfortunately, by telling everybody that they can operate uh, from home. Um, one thing that we did see, computer access and even phone access isn't guaranteed in Vermont. Some of you that serve constituents in less rural counties uh, and rural towns, one only has to look back at the disaster of what happened when they tried to move schools to uh, all online and so many kids did not have adequate computers and or reliable internet connections and or whatever to be able to connect with their schools to participate in classes. And I'm, you can debate the number, whether it's one quarter, one third of Vermont doesn't have reliable service or internet, whatever that extends now to their parents who are now trying to access government meetings uh, at night. So we think a home base with at least one board member and one staff member or, or a staff member would be wise and ensure greater transparency. I was part of one meeting where, where the state's attorney had signed on from home and uh, he was got so frustrated that he finally gave up and drove to the meeting site because there was such poor access in in his county. So there's also concerns, and this has not been really addressed, is what you do with people that uh, are in wheelchairs that can wheel into handicap accessible town offices but may not have internet connection. Is also concerned about hearing impaired sound systems on computers. So hopefully you'll address that issue and, and then ask some questions, maybe people that know more with the ADA and things like that. I did speak with Monica White, the commissioner of Dale there this week. And she says there's always concerned about people with disabilities not having access to government meetings, government buildings and so forth. So, uh, because there is a rush to push this bill through, uh, the VPA did not have a chance to talk in the house, uh, our invitation to, to come in and do our priorities is, is forthcoming and they had to push it through. I would mention one other possible concern, the right to petition government, which is one of the five basic freedoms of the first amendment 
uh, and why this country was partially founded um, is important. And as many of you know, when people present a petition to a board, uh, to a city council, to a school board, whatever, <laughs> to get somebody fired, to put something on the ballot, to uh, change an ordinance, uh, to take some government action, they in fact want uh, to make a splash and make sure the camera, TV cameras are rolling and everything like that. The bill as drafted, there is no provision for anybody to present citizens petitions to a board during a public meeting. Uh, are petitioners just supposed to show up at the chairman of the uh, school board or I hate to say the mayor of Montpelier at her home? Uh, uh, you know, where where do people turn their petitions in during a public meeting and and offer public comments? The bat the the uh, the bill does not uh, have any. Um, way to do that. So with that, I, I will wrap up. I, I may come back if this time there were a couple of questions that were asked earlier to some other people that I was going to address, but Lisa and or John may want to jump in too. And I'm glad to answer your questions too. So. Sure, thank, thank you, Mike. Um, uh, Lisa, would, did you want to did you want to add anything? Nope, I just wanted to thank Mike and say that I agree with him. I couldn't have said it better. Okay, excellent. Um, John, how about with you? Would you like to add anything? Yeah, I just, uh, I, we... Can you turn on your uh, video so we can see you? Oh, sorry. Thank you. Sorry about that. Yes. Yeah, every, uh, everybody I, wants to see John Flowers. Yeah, and, right. And, and, yeah. and introduce okay. yourself for the record, please. Uh, yes, John Flowers. I've uh, been a reporter with the Addison Independent since 1990 and have been a professional scribe since 1984. Uh, yeah, I agree with what, what Mike said. We huddled a little bit on this before beforehand. Um, I think it's eminently reasonable for um, a meeting to be anchored to some physical location for the reasons that Mike stated. Um, we as reporters certainly prefer to go to the meeting and I realize the irony of saying this on Zoom, but uh, we prefer to go to say, John, where are you? <laughs> yeah, we, we prefer to go to a location, uh, except on deadline day like it is here, but uh, but it also offers an opportunity to network with uh, public officials and um, you know more effectively do our research. So that was just one thing I wanted to bring up, but otherwise completely concur with what Mike. Mike told you. Okay, great. Thank you, John. And thank you, Mike. We have a couple of questions in the room. So Senator Vihelski. Thank you. Um, so I'm curious if we are guarantee ASL interpretation now, as I view it, it might be more accessible to someone with hearing impairment to access a virtual meeting where closed captioning is allowed or available. So I'm, I'm just curious, are we required to provide ASL interpretation? Mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure that okay. they're the I just say the the answer. No, I'm um, yeah, so but we can certainly ask Tucker okay. if there's any statutory provision. I, I don't believe so, but we can ask okay. Thank you. about that. Um, Senator Clarkson. John, Mike, it's good to see you. Um, I'm not surprised by your testimony. Sorry you didn't testify in the house. Um, <laughs> are you wanting to testify on this as a permanent consideration? Because as you know, we don't have that bill yet. Are you objecting? Because I don't recall you objecting to this uh, when we passed it three years in a row. So I'm just curious, are you objecting to this uh, a temporary provision or are you temp uh, uh, wanting to testify against the permanent inclusion of, of this as an option, not as a requirement, but as an option for open meeting law? Uh, for the record, we did. We are were opposed uh, during the thing. It did go through uh you know the other part i would say is i don't know how many meetings there actually have been without uh an anchor as john called it an anchor site i mean all the meetings i've covered 
and whatever. I haven't heard a whole lot of people say, oh yeah, there was, and that may happen more at the state level because people on state boards may be not wanting to drive and there may not be somebody in Montpelier or somebody in Burlington to, to host the thing. But I, uh, I would say while, while it is an option that uh, everybody not go to a central or one person doesn't go to the central place, I'm not sure it's a big deal, but I think we want to at least say we're concerned that it's in the bill currently as it was earlier. And we will be saying the same thing when presumably the permanent bill comes through with it in, if it's in. Senator White, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I'm surprised to hear you're not commenting on the, uh, the online versus paper piece that we have in this bill. And I'm wondering if you could speak to, for warnings and announcements, and I'm wondering if, you're, if the VPA does actually have a perspective on that. Well, we've had some in the past. There were, and we have we have tried to actually uh, imp try to improve public access notice. Uh, and made some suggestions that hadn't been taken up or didn't didn't fly. Um, we we are a little concerned that the notices go up. Um, well, let me back up. What is effective is that at the reorganizational meeting, every town and city is expected to identify the places where they will post their public uh, notices. And uh, I'm, I'm not sure, we, we objected to electronic posting to some extent. We thought that they still ought to be posted at the town office in the library, the school, you know, the usual places, the general mar general store or wherever towns post them. I mean, we just thought that those ought to continue. The decision was made to allow electronic posting. I'm not sure people know where to look for those as much as they're used to seeing them in the town library. That's why we sort of support that. And I thank you, Senator White, for bringing that point up. Thank you. Okay, thank you, but not an articulated position necessarily for this, for this temporary bill. No. Well, it's a temporary bill, and we were trying to address some of the big issues first. I, I, I know we're going to get back to notification of, you know, uh, um, public meetings and everything like that. I mean, one thing we proposed that hasn't flown was we think that at the bottom of every agenda, it ought to say where those uh, the three posting places are so that the public would uh, be able to know when they see an agenda, oh yeah, see they're at the library, they're at the general market and they're at the post office or uh, like wherever. If that was just in down in the lower left-hand corner of an agenda, it would be an educational benefit for taxpayers, but that has yet to fly. So we'll try again. <laughs> so Mike, I have a couple of questions. You brought up the, um... The, the issue of uh, a citizen petitioning their government and how there's no way to do that um, with an online meeting. And I'm, I'm just curious about that because I, I would think that it would sort of work the same way that there's there's a uh, the meetings are still required to have a public comment period during the meeting when anybody from the public could, could make comments and certainly present a petition. Now it wouldn't be necessarily a physical petition, but they could, you know, email it or post it um, somehow to uh, some kind of uh, meeting um, and and uh, present it in the similar manner. Um, have you, and I guess sort of a takeoff on that question is, have you or any of your members of the Press Association encountered any problems beyond the, you, you know, I, I hear John saying he, he loves to do things in person and I love to see John in person, um, but have you, any of your members experienced any access issues or heard of any, somebody who's trying to petition their government and hasn't been able to? Uh, I'm, I'm aware of one, one case where a group that had 150 signatures on a petition uh, really wanted to bring it into uh, a select board meeting and uh, 
they ended up bringing it in to the uh, to the town clerk, and you know there was less ta da kind of you know with <laughs> you know <laughs> no TV cameras rolling or anything like that when they dropped the petitions down on the chairman's uh, in front of the chairman at, at, yeah. at the public meeting, uh, whatever. So, uh, and that was just raised to me. I re I just thought I would mention that. I think again, I, I I think it's more about having an anchor spot. Is Got it. I see. So beyond that, have any of your members reported? Uh, no pun, pun intended there. Um, having issues with um, with access to public officials or public meetings in during this COVID period. I mean, that the, have the, the, the the one the one uh, thing that happens infrequently is that. Sometimes the hookup doesn't work, and yeah. or uh, during the meeting, it, uh, uh, Zoom will go down, and you know the people that are in the town offices are still going strong, but the people at home aren't on. And right. yeah, people yeah, have asked me, and I don't have an answer. I didn't go to law school, but I mean, is that is that a violation of the open meeting law that you don't suddenly have access? As Tucker talked about having access and being able to communicate, uh, one of the senators I think asked about you know having a, a YouTube channel. Well, that's only a one-way situation, so uh, um, you, yeah, you okay. can offer comments. On, yeah, on I, would, I would agree that it's calamitous for a, a journalist to be wholly dependent upon technology. Uh, to cover a meeting, uh, as as Mike said, it's a sure thing when you appear in person. And uh, if the uh, you know you depend solely on on ele electronics, then you you run the risk during an outage or for whatever reason that you're not going to get your story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Senator, we're going to have to move on. So we I do want we have two more questions. Um, and uh, then we're going to have to move on to our next witnesses. And I know you both know, but I just want to reiterate um, that we are going to come back to this with a, a, a longer conversation and an actual, well, I guess this is an actual bill, but another actual bill <laughs> um, about this topic. And we will certainly have you back and, and hopefully you can come and spend a little bit more time with us in person and um, hear your concerns and um, hopefully, you know, make adjustments that you feel comfortable with. Um, I'm happy to let it go. Okay, okay. okay. So again, we'll have you back and we appreciate, I'm glad we were able to get you in and accommodate your deadline schedules. Bye and, Zoom. Uh, Bye Zoom. You. And you can feel free if you want to send in a written testimony that we can put on our website for the record, we're also happy to do that. Great. Thank you very much to, to Thank everybody. Thank you very much. Good, good, good luck in your session this year. Thank, Thank you, you very so much. much. Good to see you all. Thank you. Yep. Bye. Bye bye. Okay. Um, we are, Mike, are you able to hang out or do you? I'm, I'm in for the, the long haul. I'm actually interested in hearing what other folks have to say. So don't, don't rush okay. me. Okay. Excellent. Um, then we are going to move to Sue Siglowski. Um, if you want to come on up to the table and join us. Absolutely. Um, and yeah. Um, but after the witnesses. Mm -hmm. Hi, Sue. Hi. It's nice to see you. Since you have not been here, we're going to do some introductions so you know who you're speaking with, and then you can tell us who you are, and then um, then we'll, we'll welcome your testimony. So, as you know, I'm Senator Ruth Hardy from the Addison District. And I'm Olympia Tiger, my assistant. <laughs> Senator Tanya B. Hopsky, Chittenden Central District. Uh, Rebecca White, Windsor. Bob Norris, Franklin, Washington. Ann Watson, Washington District. <clears throat> and Allison Clarkson, Windsor District. It's good to see you I, twice in one week. It's I know. Fun. Thank you very much for the introductions. And I'm Sue Siglowski. I'm the executive director for the Vermont School Boards Association. I did send in written testimony, which is on your um, website. And I brought um, paper copies of it. I don't know if you would like those, but I'll pass those around. 
I'm mainly here today to speak to section three of H42, uh, but we want to thank you for the opportunity to come in and talk about it and also let you know that we support the bill as passed by the House and really appreciate your very prompt consideration of it. Um, as far as section three goes, as you know, that is the um, piece that suspends the school budget ballot language requirement that's in um, 16 BSA section 563.11d. Um, and I'm sure you're familiar already probably from other witnesses as to what that um, required language is. Uh, I put that in my written testimony, but I won't go over that. Uh, so we think the, the required language is well intentioned, but it just relies on two elements of budget consideration process, um, the budget proposed and education spending per equalized pupil. And um, so because of that, it presents an incomplete picture and it has the potential to um, give voters um, a misunderstanding around the effects of a school district's budget approval. Um, for example, if voters see spending per equalized pupil is going up in their district, they might, um, you know, logically conclude that their um, property taxes are increasing, which may not be true, depending on the yield that gets set by the legislature and the common level of appraisal in their town. Um, conversely, if voters see that spending for equalized people is going down in their district, they may conclude their property taxes are decreasing, which also may not be true depending on the yield that's set by the legislature and the common level of appraisal in their town. Um, we know that the language in 563.11d has its roots in an interest around cost containment um, and stems from the belief that there will be transparency if boards are required to declare their year over year increase in spending um, per equalized people uh, on the ballot. But this approach assumes that if voter, voters approve a higher or lower spending for equalized people, they're going to do so knowingly, um, knowing that it translates into higher or lower tax impacts for themselves. And as I just talked about, that's not really the case. Um, the CLA, CLA, the common level of appraisal and the yields can have just as significant an impact on the tax rate, and they're not um, you know, included in that language. So given the fact that it doesn't um, accurately reflect the full picture regarding tax implications for locally approved budgets, we would respectfully request that the committee support H42 as passed by the House regarding um, section three and, and the entire bill. Um, and we'd be happy to participate in any efforts to develop required language that accurately reflects the full picture. I'd be happy to do that. Uh, so thank you for the opportunity to speak today, and I look forward to um, working with you in the upcoming session. Thanks. Are there any questions for Sue? So I do have a couple questions. Um, uh, first of all, do you know on the other part of the bill about the um, the meeting? Um, do you know how many of your member school districts? are taking advantage of fully remote meetings at this point? Are any of them doing that still? I don't have hard and fast data, but uh, anecdotally what I'm hearing is that most of them are not doing fully remote meetings at this point. Um, I think, uh, you know, if, if we would definitely come back to your committee if, uh, when you consider a bill that would be making permanent changes and I would need to get some information from the VSBA um, board about whether they support those type of permanent changes, but um, keeping it as an option for now, um, when we still have you know some unknowns happening in the world, um, seems to be a prudent thing to do. And similarly, the Australian ballot. I, I think most school districts do vote, vote their budget by Australian ballot at this point. Um, so <coughs> there are. Do you have any who are doing? There are some that still do it from the floor, yes. But this gives them an option. They they can still do it from the floor if they want to. Uh huh. Yeah. And do you, do you have any ideas how many are changing from floor to Australian under the those the, the previous temporary provisions? Like last year? Yeah. I well I I believe um, at least in 2020. Well, in 2020 we were 
past town meeting. Yeah. So 2021, I think there were quite a few that did um, take advantage of that. I don't know about 2022. Mm -hmm. Okay, but fewer and fewer. Yes. And it's yes. likely that there'll be even fewer this unless year. we get another yeah. big surge or something. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, and uh, okay, I, I think thank you for your testimony on the, the ballot language. We um, had the secretary in earlier. I don't know if you were able to listen to his testimony, um, but I'm wondering if you or your, your members have, I, I asked him if he had any sort of data on or, or an understanding of how uh, useful the language is for cost containment. And, mm -hmm. you know, he, he did mention that he thought it probably didn't do much for cost containment, but I'm wondering if you've heard from school boards um, anything different, um, or if there are school boards who feel like there's use in that language at this point. No, I've, I, I think they pretty much uh, expressed the sentiments that I put in my written testimony. But it's confusing for yes. others because it's it's, a, it's not the whole picture. Right, yeah. and um, as you know, as a former school board member, they do hold informational meetings where they really explain to the public the impacts of the budget. Mm -hmm. um, so that's you know a good place mm -hmm. to get. And are most of your information? Yes, and most, if not all, school boards at this point are posting that kind of information on their websites, and yes. and uh, it's available. Yes, they they do PowerPoints and presentations and yes, I've done those PowerPoints. Yeah. <laughs> we just help people read and listen. Right, yeah. right. Senator Clarkson, did you have another question? Uh, no, I'm. I, I, I guess I would just say that as we look at the permanent uh, proposal, again, it's only an option to be able to use. Right. right. Continue to use the open meeting. I mean, there were my opinions. It's not requiring people. So you, it, it said use the option. The option is here, and the option will you know, be approved. Is part of the proposal for permit too. Senator White, thank you, Chair, uh, Chairwoman. Um, do you have a uh, any speculation on school board volunteers and if the remote access to meetings? I mean, I, I think to our school board members, where child care for meetings is huge, and it actually, in a way, being home. I mean, it may not be the ideal child care situation to be trying to divide your attention, but it does allow parents to be a part of a school board yeah. in a new way. Have you found that at all um, as a tool for um, retaining members? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I think um, it, it seems like it would be a helpful tool uh, and it actually is available. Um, you know, a lot of boards are doing hybrid meetings. Yeah. So. Um, even if they are gathering in one place, there are a few members that will participate remotely. Um, so that that can happen even, you know, without this bill. Okay, thank you. And is happening. Yes, yeah. is happening. Correct. Great. Are there other questions? Well, thank you so much for joining us in GovOps, Sue. Thank it's you. Really nice to see you. Nice to see you as well. Thank you. Um, we have our next witness um, yes. on Zoom. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Carol, <laughs> we can't see you. Uh, <laughs> hi. hi, Carol. Hi, gang. <laughs> hi, How good are to you? see you. Um, I'm good. How about all of you? Good. Nice to thank you for joining us. Um, we're just going to introduce ourselves because you have not yet been in. We nope. would love to have you in for a general introduction to the clerks association. Mm -hmm. And we know that we're going to have many bills or at least a few bills that are, are of interest to you and your, your members. So, um, but I am Senator Ruth Hardy. I'm mm -hmm. from the Addison district. Um, and Olivia Parker, my assistant. Senator Tanya Behovsky, Chittenden Central. Nice to see you, Carol. Nice um, to see you. Rebecca Sorry. White. No, 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 you're good. <laughs> Rebecca White, Windsor. Bob Norris, Franklin. And Watson, Washington District. <laughs> Allison Clarkson, Windsor District. 
And I'm Carol Dawes. I'm the Barry City Clerk and Treasurer, and I'm Chair of the Legislative Committee for the Vermont Municipal Clerk and Treasurers Association. So thank you so much for inviting me in, um, particularly as we're fast tracking H42. I, I'm, uh, I'm hoping that that's moving quickly through your committee. So uh, yeah. Uh, we are we're doing our best this afternoon. So tell us what you would like us to know. <laughs> um, well, about that bill in particular, pass it quickly. <laughs> I tried earlier. <laughs> the, the big the big concern about that that bill is just a timeliness issue. If uh, um, if towns have the opportunity to switch to Australian ba ballot and and take that opportunity. Um, the deadline is rapidly approaching for nominating petitions for um, elected office that would be included on that ballot. Um, yes. If they do a floor vote and people make nominations from the floor, they don't have to worry about it. Uh, but if they do Australian ballot, the petitions are due by the 30th uh, of this month. So um, it's coming down the pike very quickly. Uh, and the sooner that... Um, that the bill is passed, the sooner uh, towns know whether they need to um, have candidates uh, submit petitions or not. So um, otherwise we, we fully support the bill. Um, the bill is, it's enabling language. It's not forcing anybody to do anything. It's just adding additional options to communities uh, depending on um, where we are. It gives, you know, people some an additional comfort level for health and safety. Um, and uh, so we, we fully support the bill. Okay, um, are there questions? Um, I have a couple of questions, Carol. So you mentioned the January 30th deadline for petitions for candidates running yep. for select board or whatever. Um, yep. and then is there a January, is it January 26th as the deadline for the warning if they're doing a town meeting day meeting? Is that correct? The warning has to be warned at least 30 and not more than 40 days. Okay. Before. So, so again, we're running right up against the deadline for that too. Okay. So we had gotten, I can't remember who said January 26th earlier. Oh, one oh one that's on the warning. No, for yes. the warning. Yeah. For the but it's not for the candidates. Candidates is the 30th. Right. Right. Well, the, the, you just said it's 30 to 40 days for a warning. Is Correct. That so the, so the 26th is the, is the, earliest you can do it. I see. Okay. So. Um, okay. Um, so, but there's a little bit of flexibility in that. A um, little, little bit. Yeah. There's a 10 day flexibility. So, um, yeah. okay. And um, do you have a sense or are you hearing from clerks um, how many towns are eager to use these provisions or is it just wanting the flexibility i um i have gotten over the last week i would say i've gotten a dozen emails from clerks asking for a status update on the bill because their select board was getting ready to meet and wanted to know if they could make the decision yet about moving to australian ballot so you know that's i'm sure that's not everybody that has an interest in it but uh, but they are um, they are eagerly waiting and and of course uh, many select boards don't meet weekly so they're mm -hmm. trying to fit these things into their normal meeting schedule in all likelihood they they will have to hold special meetings to make these approvals and these changes as necessary okay okay great any other questions for Carol? No. Carol, as you know, we're going to have a longer discussion about all of these issues with a with another bill. So um, we will certainly have you back then, and then we'll also be doing some bills about voting um, yep. and elections. So we'll have you back as again for those. Um, so thanks so much for your time today, and uh, stay tuned <laughs> I, <laughs> about the about this bill. <laughs> yes, and I look forward to working together. Thank you. We do too. Thank you. Take care. Okay. Excellent. We are we are getting some time back.
Oh, and got in four minutes. Yeah. Um, but we have our next witness here in person. So, Omar, you want to come up to the table sure. now that you've sort of seen how we operate? <laughs> That's not the opportunity. It's always good to come in person. And I, I, since we do have time, I do want to also mention to all committee members that we have a witness um, who was not able to be with us this afternoon, but wanted to weigh in. And he sent in written testimony. Um, Thomas Candon, is that right? That's his name, Thomas Candon. And he is a select board member, I believe, in the town of Norwich. And a former so, commissioner. And a former legislator. Oh, well, there you or go. Jack was a he is, he is, yeah, uh, Jack was. Uh, Jack was, but Tom was a former so, commissioner of banking. Well, there you go. He sent in, and it's posted on our website, so I just definitely encourage you all to take a look at that as well um, for the record on um, this bill. Pardon me? I don't know. I haven't had a chance to read it yet either. I just remembered to let everybody else know so you can take a look at what you have to say. But for now, we have a witness in person, and you've heard us say our names a bunch of times, so I think we'll... It's fun. No. We can mm -hmm. certainly do it again if you want. <laughs> <laughs> but um, if, if that's okay, we'll, we'll skip the circle <clears throat> names and um, just turn it over to you for you to introduce us yourself to us and then have, uh, take some time to tell us what you want us to know. Fantastic. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senators. Uh, my name is Omar Tryman. Uh, thank you for inviting me to speak. I did provide uh, this as a written copy as well, so you have it. Uh, I've been a resident of Norwich, Vermont for uh, over eight years. I've worked remotely for much of my career. Uh, since moving to Vermont, I've served on the Norwich Finance Committee. Uh, my wife currently serves with Tom on the school board. Um, and I'm a proponent of the value and access that availability of electronic meetings have created for organizations, uh, governments, citizens alike. Uh, I've actually benefited personally from this, uh, from the adoption of remote meeting technologies. The only reason we were able to move to Vermont uh, was because I founded a company many years ago that embraced remote work and electronic meetings, uh, once much to the, the consternation of our investors at the time. Uh, so I'm here to uh, address regarding H42, specifically section 2A. Uh, related to meetings of a public body without being physically present at a designated meeting location. Uh, and I'll just call that remote meetings or in person or face to face, uh, if that's okay. I deeply understand the compelling reasons to expand access to public meetings and highly support the increase in public participation that remote meetings have afforded to our communities. However, as numerous studies have shown, Organizations that rely exclusively on remote communications without promoting in-person relationships do suffer a negative impact due to reduced overall meeting efficiency and productivity. Public bodies who meet exclusively remotely for extended periods of time run the risk of fundamentally failing at good governance to the detriment of those same communities. Uh, I'll describe what we've seen starkly in Norwich and encourage you to consider providing some guidance and guardrails, either in this law or in future laws related to remote meetings. Um, uh, through this testimony, I do hope to encourage you to consider the balance between granting public bodies really unlimited flexibility in how they choose to meet and the risks of abuse and dysfunction when meetings are not held in person at all. Not all public bodies or local boards and committees will always benefit from the education and training to effectively weigh when to meet remotely and when a situation requires a face-to-face -face commitment. Though the examples I share may seem like outliers, I believe the greater risk is that Without sufficient structure, public bodies across the state may inadvertently end up in similar situations. Uh, the work that you're doing is uh, critical. It's already increased the ability of public bodies to conduct business. It's expanded public participation. Uh, governments and organizations around the globe are struggling to balance remote person uh, and, uh, and virtual meetings and have been for years. And the increased adoption of technologies to meet remotely uh, has become an important part of our work in our private lives. So we've all seen firsthand benefits of meeting remotely, and uh, you also know there was strong motivation by many public bodies, including this one, uh, 
uh, to return to in-person and hybrid meetings. At my remote only company, we discovered at the time, as much of the world has over the past three years, that tackling difficult questions, bridging gaps in understanding, and reaching consensus often requires a face-to-face -face conversation. The internet has taught us that you may be willing to say things to people online that good sense and humanity would keep you from expressing if you had to look your neighbor in the eye. As with many towns across the state, Norwich is faced with daunting challenges, uh, hiring and retaining staff while making dramatic increases in both the municipal and school budgets. Our select board and school board have both received considerable interest and opinions by the public and benefited of, uh, from the increased participation uh, available for remote meetings. Now, the school board adopted a hybrid approach in 2021. The quorum of the members meet in person and uh, both in-person and remote participation is available. Uh, they've been able to successfully engage in constructive debate and listen to and inform the public throughout this challenging season. There were difficult issues to consider, uh, discussions between parents and administration that influenced the school board conversations. The board, by virtue of meeting in person, successfully concluded the budget uh, process. Not everyone was happy, but everyone felt heard and respected. In contrast, the Norwich School Board is meeting tonight, actually, in person for the first time in three years. You mean the select board? Sorry, the select school board. The select board is meeting tonight for the first years. School, school board is board meeting. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. The reliance on remote remote only meetings has been to the detriment of our town. Uh, while remote meetings are safer and easier to attend, they also create distance among board members and the public. The Norwich Select Board struggled to make progress in the budget and numerous other issues due in large part to having a camera and a screen as the <clears throat> primary interface to each other and to residents in town. The select board also voted on a budget, yet the process to get there has alienated other elected officials, much of our town staff and members of the public. The various town committees uh, in Norwich that have opted for three consecutive years of remote only meetings have met similar obstacles while those that return to in-person meetings have been able to make progress on their business. Uh, as I'm sure you've experienced, remote meetings are regularly derailed by technology challenges, miscommunication on complex topics, and uh, basic courtesy that is extended in the most challenging face-to-face -face meetings. These are operational challenges for sure, and other towns may have fared better. Uh, indeed, at my company, which was fully remote from day zero, we instituted monthly in-person meetings for each team uh, in order to build rapport, tackle our bigger problems. And Norwich may be an outlier. Uh, it may also be a bellwether of what happens when public bodies are free to make uninformed decisions about how to go about the government. I hope this committee will consider the numerous studies that have shown a significant negative impact to any organization that does not foster face-to-face -face relationships. By allowing local public bodies who may not be sufficiently self-aware of the challenges of extended remote-only meetings or simply lack proper, proper training on how to over overcome those challenges uh, to continue to meet without physical presence, uh, the legislature may be inadvertently inviting increased dysfunction into our communities. So I uh, commend the Senate and the House committees uh, for quickly taking up the bill to address the ongoing needs and benefits that allow for remote participation. Uh, I hope you will consider unforeseen circumstances and of radically changing how we self-govern. Public bodies meeting in public has worked in Vermont over centuries of plagues and pandemics. Electronic remote access is an empowering advancement that towns should be required to use wisely as an addition to not an absolute replacement for regularly meeting and governing face-to-face. -face. And this public body now has the benefit of being able to take time to discuss and debate in person and to lay the groundwork for how we use technologies without accidentally abusing them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Does anyone have any questions? <clears throat> Senator Clarkson. For those of us in the Upper Valley who have read for decades of the dysfunction of the Norwich Select Board, it is not unique to having gone online. Yes. So I, while, and I fully appreciate, and I think all of us in the legislature fully appreciate the difference between our online work and what we're able to accomplish in person. 
there is no question that uh, you know we all benefit from our in person. And uh, for H forty two, and I take your uh, <coughs> testimony is really great in prep for our discussion about a permanent change. Again, it's only an option. They don't, you know, there's no requirement about about meeting remotely. Um, for H42, are, are you registering opposition to this temporary opportunity for towns to have the continued option of, of this? Or are you, do you think your testimony is really uh, for when we take this up as a permanent consideration? Uh, as a permanent consideration, absolutely, I think it's critical. Uh, for H42, really only in the context that it's the fourth year of temporary yeah actually it's only the third year third because year. i realized in 2020 we had town meeting by the time right. the, the 13th it was just a week later it was our first week mm -hmm. back right. so we would had town meeting um but it does do two years, years. It, it yeah. is two years so it, it is, is for four years, years. Yeah. yeah but i'm just saying we haven't passed that bill for three years right. we pass yeah yeah it's the, the that the bill effectively extend what's been available yes. for two years are there other questions? Oh, I don't, sorry, you, no, you, you, you did comment on uh, well Norwich in particular. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, I have had uh, the opportunity recently to speak on, on other unrelated matters to many folks who have been in town for decades, um, and they have remarked to me separately that it's, it's gotten worse. never been as bad as the common quote. So if when we take this up permanently, Madam Chair, I would hope we'd hear from several towns because here we have the, and you heard Gwen's testimony, she represents the towns and she, <clears throat> you know, I think they're very excited about uh, putting, you know, permanently the option of having open meeting laws as an option for people. So it will, I, I, I think as we were talking during the break, I would think it would be great if we actually were able to witness some of the, the footage of some of these town, uh, of these select board meetings and other, and other uh, meetings that have been recorded, because it would be, I think it would be important for us to actually review how top towns and hear from various towns, how they have functioned uh, with being, you know, you know, which ones have taken advantage of it, which ones haven't, you know, which ones have gone back to full-time in person. Seems like that'd be yeah, valuable. I think we clearly a fulsome review is in order. I really appreciated your um, your testimony yeah. in general, um, especially your suggestions about guidelines and training. Yes. And yes. certainly when we take this issue up on a permanent basis, I, I, I definitely would love to hear your suggestions on what might be included in those guidelines and who should and training and who should do it. I mean, we have VLCT, but we have also other other potential options um, and, and school boards association for schools. Yeah. Um, but that, I think that's a great uh, suggestion because I think there are a lot of towns who just don't have the experience to do it. Um, and um, having that kind of support and guidance would be really helpful, I'm sure. You're here, yeah. I think that's yeah. a great idea. Yeah, so. Thank yeah. you so much for coming in person and, and joining us in Thanks the room for, for the time. afternoon. It's been yeah. nice to have you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, we have um, with us, I think you're up if you want to come, uh, Representative Mike McCarthy, the chair of the House Government Operations Committee, <clears throat> and he can share with us the House discussion and we can ask some questions. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for having me, Senator Hardy. Um, what, what, why don't I think you know everybody? But do, would you like us to do introductions? You've served with several of, of these. Members. Yeah, I think I know everyone uh, uh, to some degree personally, except for Senator Watson. So uh, it's nice to see you in official capacity for the first time. Um, so yeah, we can dispense with introductions if okay. you like. I think I, I know everybody else pretty well. But for the record, you are. I am Representative Mike McCarthy. I'm the chair of the House Government Operations and Military Affairs Committee. Uh, I am the reporter uh, on the House side of H42. So um, we uh, gave my full report yesterday, and uh, we passed the bill over to you. Um, suspended the rules in order to expedite things. So um, we heard many of the same things that I heard in your testimony this afternoon. Uh, there's broad support. Um, from a lot of stakeholders for a temporary continuation of both 
the town meeting day flexibility, the dates, uh, the ability to hold the fully remote public meetings. Um, we also heard a lot of concerns about um, some of the issues around the equity of access. Um, I think the Vermont Press Association, it was great that you had them in. We were not able to get them in um, to on the House side, but um, all of these concerns around what the guardrail should be, what are best practices for open meetings, for holding hybrid meetings, which is the, the hybrid meeting piece, I think is actually a piece we should really delve in and say, you know, bring in, what did people learn from all over the country and the world during COVID about how do you really hold a good hybrid meeting? Because I've been to a lot of bad ones. <laughs> and I think we're doing some great work here in the state house on that. Um, but we should really figure that out and make sure that we're um, preserving the level of access and the flexibility that people I think have come to expect. Um, but that we're also for the long term making sure that we put the right guardrails, the right training um, for public bodies. Um, so these concerns of been heard loud and clear. Um, mm -hmm. I think both you and I have voiced repeatedly the commitment that we'll work together on a longer term uh, bill this biennium. So um, yeah, I just want to thank you for doing this work and getting everybody in here so quickly. I think um, I just want to be able to answer the questions that you have. Uh, if there was anything else remaining about why the heck did we put <laughs> a particular provision in H42 or anything like that. So does anyone have Questions for Representative McCarthy. Did, did Dan Senator Clarkson? Did Dan French? He didn't testify, as I recall. He, he didn't, didn't have a chance. He, he did not. Uh, so we heard from uh, Jeff Francis. We had reached out to several folks at the V's, um, and uh, Jeff was the only one who came before us. But we got emails anecdotally from um, several folks, and mm -hmm. one of the things that triggered my um, inclusion of section three, the language around the ballot was that the superintendent of schools for the Maple Run Unified School District, which is um, the St. Albans and Fairfield, all the, the schools up our way, um, Bill Kimball reached out to me and said, you know, you guys got rid of this ballot language specific requirement for fiscal 25 through 29, why not for this year? Um, and a lot of the same logic applied. So uh, I was able to work with our chair of ways and means to get together quickly. And I think it only cost us a day on the House side. Of, um, so I, I hope that that doesn't cause too much consternation over here. But I think it's a real benefit. Um, as you heard from uh, the VSBA, the language specifically around putting the percent per pupil number uh, in this era where we've had excess uh, spending thresholds suspended, where CLAs are moving around all over the place because of a volatile real estate market. It has very little relationship in a lot of towns to the things that voters care about, which is what's the difference in our budget and what is our actual property tax bill going to be. Um, so having that specifically the percent equalized per pupil change year over years, it, it's not a very meaningful thing to include uh, on the ballots in many towns. And I believe um, the House Ways and Means Committee heard from a number of witnesses on the bill and that specific provision, including um, the uh, Secretary of uh, Craig, Bol Craig Bolio, Commissioner, sure. Commissioner of Taxes. I knew it was wrong. I was like, it's not a secretary. Commissioner of Taxes. Um, and uh, But the secretary came in to talk with us. So I think they delivered the same message, but um, different. Yeah. I don't think that Representative Kornheiser would be mad at me for saying that, uh, and I believe she may have said on the record that they have a pretty strong commitment uh, to looking at what the specific ballot language should be so that there is some consistency uh, across the state. Uh, so I think that'll probably come up pretty quickly this year. Yeah, she and I have had those conversations before. It was definitely an issue that we talked about during the people waiting conversation, but had too many other things to get to. So we never got to that. So we just suspended it in that bill. Um, so it is it is problematic language. Um, it doesn't, um, as um, we've heard in testimony from the uh, School Boards Association, um, doesn't do what it's purported to do. Um, are are there other things that we didn't hear that you might want us to know? Um, you heard an awful lot. I think that the the things that I think about is just how um, many 
the, the one thing maybe you didn't hear today, uh, I wasn't here for quite all of your testimony that might be worth mentioning, was about uh, how many of the, the sort of just, we need to make one motion, so we need to have a meeting of a commission, for instance, to do one piece of business, how many miles traveled or saved by having remote meetings? And I think part of what we need to think about when we do the long-term bill is the kind of climate impact and the vehicle miles traveled that we're saving when some of those meetings that don't really benefit that much from having an in-person component where you know we're doing the business of the people and just moving some thing through. I think, for instance, the city council and city of St. Albans, we had a, um, a, a license approval that we wanted to expedite for a restaurant that was just changing hands. Mm -hmm. All of the paperwork came in in between meetings. And so we got them their, their license approval two weeks early by just holding a remote meeting saved everybody from having to drive from work and it got that restaurant's license expedited. Those are the kinds of things that we need to really think about um, just the broad impact of and the use of the tool um, as we also consider some of the concerns about not having as many face-to-face uh, -face interactions and the benefit of that. And, and just for full transparency, a conversation that Representative McCarthy and I have had about the longer term conversation, the, the bill covers two years and that's partly to to give us the runway that we need to have the longer term conversation. That being said, if we get our work done sooner, we can certainly make changes for the second year if we're, you know, if we are able to come to agreement this year about the longer term. Um, so, you know, I think that we all are committed at, to having this conversation. I think that we've heard some really good suggestions for the yeah. long term and things that we should consider and questions we need to be asking and people we need to be hearing from. So I think that we're sort of set up well to have that longer conversation and maybe we can get it done sooner than we thought we could and um, and maybe even start it next year or at least start to move it into process for next year. Um, so yeah. No, I that sound good. Just amen to that. I think if we can move it faster, that's great. I I particularly wanted to make sure that we had plenty of time to hear all the different voices, yeah. the different towns, the different experiences that people have had, and make sure that we have the opportunity to pull in some national and international best practices. Yeah. And I think also the fact that that I was reminded today that this isn't just about school boards and select boards. This yes. is about all the thousands of other little tiny committees that meet in our towns and in our state. Um, so there are state implications, state level implications and municipal implications, and we need to do justice to both of them. Yes, um, so. we learned today that on average, every town has eight commissions, no matter what size the town is. That's the minimum. minimum. No, that's, that's the minimum. minimum. That's like right. a town is eight. Yeah. 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 As many yeah. as eight. So I mean, we, we all know there are a million uh, little so, committees. Yeah, but, on that, but that number that the minimum was eight was really yeah. staggering to me when you think. And the school boards have seven. at least eight because they're all the subcommittees of school boards too. Yes. So there's so many, and and it's I think the the participation. Uh, uh, ability for participation from you mentioned parents. There are others. That, um, oh. So there's certainly a lot to continue to talk about. Um, we are going to have Tucker back at 4:30 okay. um, to answer a couple of questions that I wrote down that came up that Good. I want to make sure we have some actual legal answer on. Um, and I gave um, Bloomer's office a heads up that we yeah we Bloomer's coming in has come until. in also. Um, so you're welcome to stay and you're welcome to I'm, stay there. I have a chair's meeting that I okay. should run off to. Um, so right. if you don't have any further questions for me, I will happily. And I will let you know how things go. Um, yeah. And thanks. Well, congratulations, for Mr. Chair. chair. Yeah. Our counterpart. Yeah, it's, uh, I'm really looking forward to working on many bills with you all. We have a lot of bills on our wall that were introduced just today. Oh, so, really? oh, you know, you're we should, have three. Yeah. we should have three up there. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, yeah we're, we're going to have it all. Yeah, we'll, 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 we'll talk tomorrow morning. <laughs> sounds great. <laughs> sounds, sounds good. Thanks, Mike. Have a good evening. Oh, you too. So while we're waiting for Tucker, you can tell him we're ready if he wants to come down, but we can wait for a support. Um, we're going to hold off on a, a, an actual motion until we hear from Tucker one more time, but I just sort of want to take the temperature around the room um, about what you're feeling. <clears throat> uh, I, I know how you're feeling. No, no. <laughs> I No, I wasn't. Oh, and okay. I forgot to ask Mike. 
Oh, but do we know what the vote was in the house? Did they do a roll call? <clears throat> yeah, oh, I forgot to ask him. No, it was a voice vote, and he said he heard one no on the voice yeah. vote, and so that was it. It was pretty unanimous. Yeah, it was It was pretty strong. I thought I got um, 12 out of there. 12 do you want me to just run out and grab them? Sure. Oh, the <clears throat> uh, on the committee vote, I think it was 12 0. Yeah, on the, the committee vote, it was a voice vote. Okay, so, yeah, so it was a unanimous in both committees, I believe. And then just a one random no on the floor, mm -hmm. um, which, as I learned, might have been a mistake. I learned the lesson the hard way to write down what your book's supposed to be. Oh. Yes, it's true. <laughs> you yes. sort of get caught yes. in the momentum yes. and give you a coin. It says yes and no on it. It's oh, yeah. Oh. It can be really, I, especially yeah. on those. Occasions when you're voting opposite what you're used to voting, and then yes. you kind of get for you caught up in yes, that's um, true. I voted um, the wrong way on a couple things and had to change my vote, or it was just like it was the random no. <laughs> um, so back to this discussion though. Um, I saw a thumbs up. Uh, Senator Norris, how are you feeling? I feel all right. I don't think we have a whole lot of options at this point. I mean, the way I'm looking at this, I mean, it's something that we're kind of trying to like. For lack of a better term, ran through because it needs it needs to be there. So I don't know what we can really do at this point. Then besides uh, work on a longer term solution when when it comes right. up. Yeah. Okay. Great. That's good to hear. I said very similar space. There's some things that you know longer term solution that I feel a little uncomfortable with change, <clears throat> but given the need for expediency on this, I don't feel strongly enough about any of those that I would want to stand for. Right? Okay. Senator White. Yeah, I'm good. Too. Senator Watson. Very happy. Okay. Senator Clarkson. Ready to I'm, rock and roll. I'm ready to rock and roll. Okay, so um, as soon as we have Tucker down here, I'm going to a couple. I have three questions that I wrote down that we just wanted clarification on about some things, and then um, we can entertain a motion. Um, the Finance Committee did hear the same testimony from the Secretary, and um, there were a couple members that were a little uncomfortable with that ballot language, but they felt she, they didn't want to stand in the way, I think. Um, so. Um, that's my um, impression. And I'm glad Grace and Vince is taking that up. Yeah, and now that's good. They're they're not gonna actually get the bill. They just took they just took one test. Right, no, no, but ways I'm glad that Ways and Means are gonna take it up, which is great. Right. That so that's good. Oh, there it Tucker, is. Tucker, thank you so much. We have just, I wrote down three questions that I wanted to make sure we got answered before we voted on the bill. Um, they're not necessarily direct, directly related, but they came up and nobody could answer them. Okay. And that's why maybe nobody No can. pressure. <laughs> <laughs> if anyone can, it'll be you. <laughs> what if a town does a warning and then changes its mind and wants to uh, revoke that warning and change it and rewarn something different? Is that permitted? Like if, for example, we didn't get this bill passed in time for when they had to do the warnings and then we passed it and they decided they wanted to actually do an Australian ballot, but they'd already warned that it was a floor vote, could they change their mind and rewarn it? Provided that they moved the date of the annual meeting and could otherwise meet the statutory deadlines for preparing for an Australian ballot election. Mm -hmm that would likely be permissible. And if you would like a more concrete legal answer, I can do some research and get back to you. However, it is my understanding that so long as you can meet the statutory deadlines to announce and warn about the <clears throat> annual meeting, prepare the ballot appropriately, and uh, if necessary, mail early and absentee ballots, that you can likely do that. You can basically say, oops, that was not what we meant to warn. We'd rather warn this thing. That was informal way of saying it, but what <laughs> 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 you said more formally. <laughs> okay, excellent. That was one. Um, there came a question about access for um, people um, who are hearing impaired and about um, whether or not if you're having an in-person meeting, if there are requirements for in-person meetings for ASL translation. So Title I, Chapter 3, Subchapter 7 or 9 is uh, the right to uh, interpreters for individuals with hearing impairments. It applies to every level of government 
and the triggering requirement is that the individual um, needs an interpreter and it is necessary for that person to participate in the meeting that is being held. That applies additionally to these meetings, but that is strictly for interpreter interpreters. There are layers of federal law over this, of course, um, that I am not as well versed in. Mm -hmm. But it is my understanding that if there are ADA compliance requirements um, that would require, for example, transcription or assistive devices, um, this is not going to affect any of those layers. Meaning that if, if a town is meeting in a select board meeting, for example, or school board meeting, and somebody needs assisted devices or some kind of interpretation, they are they have a right to those. There, I think there are some requirements for warning in advance, saying a certain amount of time in advance, correct? Um, it, it is my understanding that under the ADA, the person would have to make a request for an accommodation. Okay, and so in a remote meeting, if a, if a town or school board is meeting remotely or in a hybrid fashion and somebody is participating remotely, is would the same apply to them? They could request in advance assistance. Yes. But they have and technically on their computer they have the ability to have a transcription. Yes. So they automatically have that option. There are also opportunities through Dale to request right. certain software and um, mm -hmm. assistive devices for these sorts of meetings, okay. even electronic meetings. And this did come up in past discussions of the other temporary authorizations and there's even a matrix that's available to all of the public agencies of the state where you can see exactly which meeting platforms have um, ADA compliant and other assistive technology already built into them. So that if you receive a request as a public body for a certain type of access, you can use this matrix to understand, all right, if we use this meeting platform, on this day, this person will be able to access each of these mm. assistive technologies. Okay. So that's a resource that's out there for public bodies as well. Okay. So there's the opportunity for access that way. Okay. And then the last question is, what happens if a connection goes down, people lose internet, the, you know, there's the, the general tech issues that we all know can happen and the meeting is no longer available <clears throat> to the public. What, how does that trigger the open meeting law? That, you know, how does that impact? What, what happens then? <laughs> so there's a couple layers to this. First, there's an underlying requirement in the open meeting law, which is not suspended by this, that all of the members of a public body be able to hear the other members and are capable of being heard during the meeting. That's not suspended. So the, the technological failure caused the members to not be able to actually conduct the meeting, then they can't hold the meeting. Mm -hmm. The meeting's ended. The meeting's ended. Okay. Um, here, the public body is required to use technology that, quote, permits the attendance of the public through electronic or other means, and that allows the public to access the meeting by telephone and enable the public to directly access and participate in the meeting electronically. Mm -hmm. Those three requirements likely stack to require that if the public cannot access the meeting, mm -hmm. that the meeting can't be held. So if, if a, something happens and the sound goes out and somebody you know, types in the chat, we can't hear anymore and they can't fix it pretty quickly, then the meeting would just have to be suspended and rescheduled or something until the tech issues are taken care of. Yes, that is likely the case. It would also be prudent for that public body to not hold that meeting if there were concerns about the ability for public participation. And the one thing that I am going to check <laughs> is whether the public participation subsection in 1 VSA section 312 
Like, well, Mark, this is our legislative council. This is amazing. This is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> you look very amused. Yeah. But no, and it's great for you to see our only staff. Uh, this, you know, these are our staff members. Yeah. Yeah. How incredible they are. I'm very lucky. Functionally, I'm just confused how that would apply to an all remote meeting. Like if it was a hybrid meeting, I could see the remote option disappearing and and the people in the room being able to to, maybe continue. to continue. But if it's all remote, if the remote access goes down, the remote access goes down and no one has access. So and then well, wait, wait, let's oh yeah, let's the center. That's that's, that's the part of that subdivision three that I was referring to about allowing the public to directly access the meeting. The only way that they would not be able to directly access is if the platform didn't allow the meeting to happen. Yeah. Because yeah. they're getting the same level of access to the electronic platform as the mm -hmm. members of the committee or board. So mission. While you're looking for that, go ahead, Senator Clarkson. There are issues, of course, in person too. I mean, you know, the power goes out. The you know, there are things that happen that make a meeting not unattainable you know, in person as well. And they would only be able to continue in person and a hybrid meeting if they had a quorum. So if a quorum were there in person, they could continue. If not, if the quorum was online, they couldn't because there wouldn't be enough people there. That's good point. Okay, go ahead. In 1 VSA 312 subsection G, excuse me, H, it states that at an open meeting, the public shall be given a reasonable opportunity to express its opinion on matters considered by the public body during the meeting. So the platform you are using due to some technological failure does not allow the public to meet this level of participation which is not suspended, then we really have to be either temporarily closed or adjourned until it could be reconvened and access can be granted again. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Are there any other questions for just, Tucker? Yeah, go ahead. Just a quick one. So if the public has the access to the meetings, all the questions are answered. Everyone sitting in their house, no case, we'll take a roll call now, vote order for us. Probably had access to the meeting. And so the chair says, okay, we're gonna vote now, and so boom. If they lose their, I mean, does the meeting stop then after the public has had their access? The only thing they're missing at this point is the voting of the board. It could be something that needs to be voted on tonight. I mean, I, I don't know, I'm just asking. That is likely going to go back to public attendance. And the question of law there is, if the public is not able to, I'm actually gonna go back to Senator Vyhovsky's point which was that if the public for some reason is being closed out of direct access, which is afforded to them under these temporary procedures, then the meeting itself is also just not happening. So do they have to warn it again, just for the vote or? What I'm saying- I, I'm is, not opposed to this. That's not, yeah. I'm, just, I'm just trying to what work I'm out the- What I'm saying is that under your scenario, if yeah. the public, there's not gonna be a difference in access between the members access to the electronic platform and the public. So if a, um, get to that point, they're about to hold their vote and the platform goes down and no one can access the meeting. They're simply not meeting, right? The platform is unavailable and they'll have to try to reboot it or close and reconvene in person <coughs> or at a later date. Yeah. Okay, Senator Vyhovsky. So just a quick clarifying <clears throat> point on that. What I hear you saying is that the public has to have the same access to the meeting as the members do for the duration of the meeting. They have to be given direct access. It can't be direct access for this portion, and then we send you over to YouTube and you can watch the rest of it. It has to be for the entire duration of the meeting. The language of H42 does not say for the duration of the meeting. It says that they have the public has to be given um, in the warned notice and posted agenda for the meeting the ability to directly access and participate in. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I, sorry. No, it's okay. I'm just trying to because in there's so much nuance to this because you know I'm hearing that that perhaps someone could be given direct access for the public comment section and then told like go watch the rest of this on YouTube. And the way I read this law, that would not be acceptable. But perhaps someone else might interpret that as acceptable because they were given direct access. It was then just taken away. Mm -hmm. Um, 
Well, I can think of maybe another scenario where that could happen, and that is that public bodies in the open meeting law are allowed to adopt reasonable rules for the participation of the public in the meeting. And you might have an instance, the General Assembly certainly had one early on uh, in the early days of Zoom, where you have a member of the public who purposefully um, sabotages the meeting and then you have to remove that person from participation. We have had training on that, Omar. <laughs> I, I actually remember uh, it's a VSBA training, Sue, um, where there's a distinction between a public meeting and a meeting of the public. And town meeting is a meeting of the public. That's that's the town coming together to have right. a meeting of the public and vote on their town budget or whatever before the public. <clears throat> a public meeting is a school board meeting, a select board meeting, all these other boards that the public has to have access to and be able to participate. But that's not their meeting. They don't get to, to weigh in anytime they want. Just like in here, people talk hopefully, when the chair gives them the, the permission to speak. And so, you know, Sue and Omer are sitting here, but they're not at the table talking to us like we are. So I think that's a distinction that is allowed in the law. And in this fact, it is a, an important distinction between a meeting of the public and a public meeting. Yes. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay, are there other questions for Tucker before we take a vote or before we consider a motion? You're just stretching. Okay, thank you very much. Um, do you have something else to add? Oh, I go do. for it. If you would, um, <clears throat> some, someone reached out to me with a differing legal opinion about the issue of whether a municipality can use the temporary Australian ballot authority to then uh, vote as a municipality to permanently adopt the Australian ballot system. Uh, it is my legal opinion that 17 BSA 2680 in subsection B would prohibit that. So I wanted to make sure that I read it, provided you with the alternative legal opinion, and gave you the opportunity to correct this if you feel that it's an issue. I'll highlight something from a previous act in a minute. Subsection E states, and I will quote directly, a municipality shall not use the Australian ballot system at the same election at which its voters decide that the system shall be used. It's a little That's bit wordy, yeah, but it states that you shall not use right. the Australian ballot system at the election where you're voting to use that system. So if a municipality through its legislative body votes to adopt use Australian ballot during this temporary period, it is my opinion that the subsection, which has not been suspended or superseded, would still apply. However, there are those that believe that is not the case. And in the past, in Act 77 specifically, there was a subsection that said, 17 BSA 2680 subsection E shall apply during this temporary period to the Australian ballot provisions and no municipalities, you may not use this temporary authority to permanently adopt the Australian ballot system. Mm -hmm. So if that is something that you would like to, again, expressly add to this temporary authority, I would suggest that you do. I still am Stand a firm them. belief that 17 mm -hmm. 2680 <laughs> It's very clear that you cannot use the Australian ballot system to put the question to the town and allow them to adopt permanently the Australian ballot. Um, in looking at the language that's in the bill, um, in the bill, or is it referenced? Okay. Um, it just references. It just references yeah. today. Um, okay. Um, how are people feeling about that? Do um, are we comfortable with the language that's there right now, or do we want to make it more explicit? Um, let me know if you're not comfortable. Is anyone? Okay. I think we trust your legal opinion. Um, 
and we're going to leave it the way it is. Um, do you have a different question? I have a quick yeah. history oh. question about 17 BSA 2680 and when that was adopted. There's a reason I'm asking. I'm not just testing, like testing your trivia knowledge. Sorry, can you repeat your question? Um, my question is when was 17 BSA 2680 adopted? Which is why. Um, so I believe um, Essex did use an Australian ballot to institute an Australian ballot. And I'm trying to understand, I'm trying to know if that occurred before this law happened or after. <laughs> I'm sorry. But it, and it doesn't have to, I don't need the answer right now. Um, give it yeah, so maybe this is a, since this is a separate issue, unless you can answer it really quickly. Um, we do have a request from one of our earlier witnesses who has stayed with us on Zoom to come back in for just, Mike, if you're still there, you can have just a couple minutes where um, um, we, we are getting close to the time when we need to get things done. So um, you, if you want to just do a couple more minutes in that. I I, I just was going to offer a comment about the issue of postponing the town meeting. I saw two different things happen. One, uh, where there was a faulty warning and they had to cancel the town meeting and therefore it was got pushed out. So I don't know if that addresses the question of that the Senator from Essex had asked whether that was one way of doing it. The other thing that I saw was that the school uh, Secretary of State and the Attorney General's office forced a cancellation of a town meeting and they had to rewarn it and everything like that up in Isla Bot. And so again, that was another situation where they had approved a warning and they ended up changing the warning the second time around. Okay. And like that. So there's some past history in the book somewhere. Just that, that has happened. That's all I was gonna offer right there. So excellent. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Mike. I appreciate sure. it. Yep. Tucker, do you have any answer? 1977. Oh, okay. Well, then we're very much not. <laughs> okay, it was not then. Thank you. Um, all right. I am, unless there's another question for Tucker, Tuck, uh, uh, Senator Clark. Oh, right. oh, okay. oh, sorry. Um, thank you so much, Tucker. Much appreciated. And if you have a, a summary of the bill or anything you've already written, if you could send it along that way. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I'm ready to entertain the motion. Senator I'm ready Carson. to provide one for you. I would move that we pass uh, H42 as sent to us by the House intact uh, favorably. Excellent. Thank you. Are, is there any discussion? Further discussion? All right. The clerk, would you like to call the roll? I'd love to. <laughs> Senator Bohuski. Yes. <laughs> Norris, yes. Clarkson, yes. Boyd, yes. Watson, yes. Madam Chair Hardy, thank you. Yes. Great. Senator Clarkson, well, I missed somebody. Would you like to report? <laughs> <laughs> All right, excellent. I will report the bill tomorrow, and uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, will be our first bill. Very exciting. Very exciting. Thank you, committee. Thanks for a great work this afternoon, and I, I think we've laid some really good groundwork for our future discussion on this. Um, and if there's nothing else, we can go off.